critique of Garten of Banban. Ban. Not a one hour video of me ranting about a perceived problem with the game's quality and calling for its dismissal and whatever the popular thing to do is in this corner of the internet. No. A complete look at everything that I have found about it, its place in the genre, its developers, reception, mechanics, gameplay, horror, and of course, story. And while I will periodically talk about the games this series took inspiration from and show examples of how they handle mechanics, gameplay, and horror elements, I will not be judging Garden of Ban Ban based off of them. I think it's important to judge games based on their own merits, and I think that will be especially important for this series. When looking at and critiquing a game that very obviously takes heavy inspirations from other things, it is really, really important to look at that game as its own thing, rather than the next blah blah blah. Now that's not to say that you can't compare it to the thing that it's taking inspiration from, that's completely fine. But again, you have to remember to look at it individually as well. Now back to this series, my introduction to this game series was definitely less than standard. I made videos responding to one particular individual, and one of those videos was responding to him talking about the first game in this series. And I found how he handled the entire thing just bafflingly terrible, but ultimately went on with my day since I didn't know much about the game. But then I got curious and did some digging of my own, and found a few more people saying even more profoundly deplorable shit, and was just overall completely disappointed with what I found, which then prompted me to buy all the games that were currently available, play them with a friend, and document the entire experience on my second channel, Bowie Hunter Offline, link down below, and bringing us to these videos. Let me be very clear. This isn't going to be some bullshit eight minute video insulting every aspect that I can think of. We have a lot to go over. Since this video, I learned a lot about this series. A lot. About the games, the story, the genre, the devs themselves, and we're going to talk about all of it. The game's launch and its reception. The game in relation to the genre. The devs and the criticism they received. The game's mechanics and gameplay. And finally, the story. And because we have a lot to go over, this will be split into two videos, with this one being all about the developers and everything that I could gather about the games ranging from their reception to the criticism they received by the community to their place in the genre itself. That will give me the entire second video complete focus on critique of the games themselves and the overarching story, which I really, really want to go over. Cause goddamn is it something. But for now, let's get this shit out of the way. To say this game had an explosive launch would be the understatement of this century. It started out almost as obscurely as Five Nights at Freddy's did when it first released, with Fusion Z Gamer making his gameplay video gaining a little bit of attention, and then Super Horror Bro making his video and having it spiral from there with uh yeah having his batshit insane irrational response to it. And it finally blew up despite his intentions of having it gain negative traction. Yes, I am absolutely sussing out malicious intent from this dude. From what I can tell, the reception was mixed. Some were positive about it, some were negative due to the length of game, limited animations, bland textures, poor drone mechanics, and overall lack of horror elements to make the experience a spooky one. Now remembering the context is important here, when the first game was released, it was just this 5 minute experience with a merch store and a chapter 2 coming soon. And after that came the criticisms that I could find. Now we'll talk about this a little more later, but I'll briefly mention it here. There are numerous accounts that the developers received fair and constructive criticism about this game and the series, and they just ignored it. Not only did I not find anyone giving constructive critiques, but I also got conflicting information. And I was especially tipped off with this comment. You know, I'm actually baffled that you managed to give Garten of Ban Ban of all things a critical and thoughtful review. 
I'm probably reading it wrong, but it felt a little odd that me giving it a critical look was baffling if the game was fairly critiqued before. Like I said, we'll talk about that a bit more later, but regardless, I saw a lot of videos that came out around that time. And perhaps unsurprisingly, some of them were from people who mentioned Oya oh yeah, and basically just followed the same shit that he said. Not once giving it a single ounce of individual thought. I'm getting ahead of myself, but just... Uh, the way these fucking videos were handled just sets me off. Regardless, everything was said and done. The game took off, YouTubers played it, and some liked it, some didn't, and ultimately everyone said their piece and moved on. Then only a few months later, Garden of Ban Ban 2 was released, and there were some noticeable improvements to include voice acting, a little better animation, at least one element that can be pretty unsettling, and there's some semblance of a story going on, but that didn't stop people from refunding it after they beat it in under two hours prompting a less than stellar response from the developers, and of course we will talk about that whole situation later. Garten 3 was released a few months after 2 and people immediately noticed that it was long and speculated that it was done in response to the refunding which seems to check out with the unnecessarily long hallways and tedious tasks. And the next games that were released after were 4 and 6, leaving 5 and 7 to release later in the future. Understandably, people were very confused about how that happened. Apparently 5 was supposed to be a prequel. It, it's a very confusing situation. We will, like I said, talk about all of this. But before we do, I think it's important to discuss this game's place in relation to the overarching genre, that being mascot horror. For anyone unfamiliar, Garden of Ban Ban is not the first game to have the sort of formula that we'll talk about in a second. It is very much just the most recent example, but real quick, what is mascot horror? It's a genre of horror that uses a mascot, oddly enough, or some other artificially made recognizable character often associated with or being related to children and children's media. Say for example, a toy, or a restaurant, or a cartoon. Something that you would normally see marketed to children to be fun, happy, friendly, lovable, etc. We all know the type. And the genre will take that mascot image and distort it to something horrifying, normally by having the mascot being corrupted in some form or another. The very earliest example that I can point to is a game called Tattletale, giving a horror spin on the Furby line. Then you have Five Nights at Freddy's having its spin on Chuck E. Cheese, and Bendy and the Ink Machine being a play on Disney, and finally Poppy Playtime, which I honestly have no real world comparison for. I don't really keep track of children's toys. And you'll notice that a lot of the games in this genre are highly marketable with related merch for said games. I didn't see much of it from Tattletale because of how small the game was, but I believe FNAF was one of the first to really take off with merch sales, which, I mean, okay, I can kind of understand the reasons why people would buy this. I mean, look at it, it's adorable, but once you put the context of the games behind it, uh, the, the, these are animatronics with dead children inside of them. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. But another thing that you'll notice is that each and every single one of these games is different. The art style, the mechanics, the level designs, and even the monsters. Every game is individually identifiable, and you can clearly tell them apart. So... Let's talk about Garden of Ban Ban's part in this whole thing. Garden of Ban Ban was very quickly seen as a very lazy attempt to cash in on the mascot horror hype train that was generated from games like FNAF and Poppy Playtime due to its comparatively very basic textures, animation, generic blobby monster design, and extremely short introduction with a nice marketing cherry on top and was almost immediately labeled as a representation of the sad state of mascot indie horror. That being predatory marketing with one goal in mind, maximizing profit by any means necessary 
by being marketed towards kids. Because of this, Garden of Banban received a proverbial tidal wave of criticism and hate by the mascot horror community. Now, on that subject, I've heard a few things from two people that have quite a bit of experience with mascot in indie horror, and I would like to take a moment to let you all hear what they have to say in these uh, clips here. Let's have a listen. Chapter. The basic monster design and the clear attempt to cash in with a merch page on the main menu of its first installment. It was hailed as the final nail in the mascot horror coffin. The moment that the genre jumped the shark. A cash grab with no thought or care put into it, to which I say, yeah, them and every other mascot horror game out there. I mean, Mob Games announced a movie and made NFTs immediately after the success of Chapter 1, which, mind you, was only a half hour experience. Hello Neighbor was so busy making TV pilots, books, and spin-offs that they basically forgot they had to build their game beyond an alpha, and Scott was busy releasing a new FNAF game every few months back in the old days, just like we see Garten and Banban doing now. The point is, while these things may be cause for concern, they're also not exactly new for the genre. Mm hmm, mm hmm, I see. Thank you, thank you very much, Matthew. Let's go to the next one here. But also people were like, how can he like Garden of Ban Ban and not like Hello Neighbor? And I'm like, because Garden of Ban Ban was a completable experience. It had a beginning and an end, and sometimes that's my basic requirement for a game. Was there a middle? Yes, actually, there was a middle, and it worked, okay. and also it was improving with each iteration. By the time the third chapter rolled out, it was improving, because it was made by just a couple of dudes, and they were getting better at it, and I'm like, since when, and I know people are all up in arms about it, but it was like, it's such a cash grab, and I'm like, who cares? If people want to buy the merch, then that's fine. What is wrong with that? I don't get what's wrong with that. Like, we sell merch at store.dis distractiblepodcast.com. We do! I just want to quickly interject here to say I 100% agree with Mark on the whole money thing, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but hang on. We're not done yet, because this next thing I think is really, really important to understand Mark's perspective on this whole thing. Yeah, for it, for it, like, I don't get why people were so animalistically opposed to it, which made me get entrenched in the idea of, like, well, fuck all you guys, I'm gonna support this made by an indie developer, an actual indie developer, you know, where it's just a couple of people. I was like, why are people kicking down this thing? People try to make games all the time. I, long time ago, I made, I, I played a game and I just shat on it. Like, this is when I was, like, in my second year of, of doing YouTube, because it was bad. And then... I realized because it really, really hurt the developers' feelings. Like, it really did. And I realized how much my words uh, impacted it. And I realized that that was their first attempt at making a game. And if you're going to shit on someone for their first attempt at making a game, and I don't know if Garden of Bam Bam was their first attempt, then it's like, you, you gotta, you gotta, like, hold back a little bit. And you notice I didn't say these Hello Neighbor opinions back when it was coming out. I said it many years later after it's been very clear that they've been milking this shit for a very long time. Time that's like I don't know why people pay it. So firstly, I think Mark made a very fair observation because while Poppy Playtime, Hello Neighbor, and Bendy and the Ink Machine all got their fair share of criticism, I don't remember it ever being to the level that I've seen with Garden of Ban Ban. Now maybe that's because I'm getting older and I'm just not remembering shit. But well, say for example, while Poppy Playtime had its amount of drama. I don't remember quite as many people saying that it was all of this stuff like a cash grab or an example of the sad state of mascot horror or whatever that bullshit is. Now, secondly, and this is the more important thing that I want to talk about related to Mark here, and it makes me respect and appreciate him more as a person. He is a YouTuber with 36 million subscribers. He understands what just completely dunking on a game could potentially do, especially for an indie game developed by two people. Just based off of that one experience with shitting on that one game in just his second year of YouTube. I believe him when he says he is supporting this game series and the devs, but even if he does have harsh criticisms for it, I think he is being more than responsible with keeping the size of his fan base in mind. Also, I want to point out this comment too. 
But also people were like, how can he like Garden of Ban Ban and not like Hello Neighbor? And I'm like, because Garden of Ban Ban was a completable experience. It had a beginning and an end. And sometimes that's my basic requirement for a game. Very important to remember that Garden of Ban Ban is not the only indie game that he's played in recent years. His little playlist of X number of scary games, those are all one or two person indie games on itch.io or GameJolt. Mostly just demos that will more than likely not take off without someone, a YouTuber, calling attention to them. I just feel like this stuff is worth commenting on because I think it provides context for anyone that maybe was wondering why Mark is supportive of this game. And also Matt pointing out that Garten isn't doing anything that the other games haven't absolutely spot on. So, maybe this game is a representation of the state of the mascot horror genre. I think that'll be a conversation for when we actually start critiquing this game, because I think that's an important conversation to have. But it's just made more obvious by the inexperience that I have seen. Because I do not believe for a moment that the lack of details and polish and textures and environments was done purely out of malice or laziness. However, if this is a case of laziness or little effort, I will say that this is not the first time I have seen little effort in a mascot horror game. And the other examples that come to my mind immediately do a little bit worse in that aspect. I will remind everyone of a little two-game series called Case Animatronics. Ah, Matthew, what the hell? I'll have to take a day off because of you. Hello, Jack. Sorry, but Matthew is out. Who are you? And what happened to my partner? He's a tough cookie. Listen, you're the doctor. How could he even be walking around with a hole in his head? He's a tough cookie. Listen, you're the doctor. How could he even be walking around with a hole in his head? And what are you going to do? Did you forget who's after us? I'm not dragging him along with me any further. And what are you going to do? Did you forget who's after us? I'm not dragging him along with me any further. Now it's become painstakingly clear to me that I need to emphasize that a game can have good graphics and art design and models and still be lazy. I have seen lazy writing in visually stunning games. I have seen lazy character animation in games with beautifully grotesque and horrifying monster designs. Okay, I'll definitely get a- Nope, it is just an invisible wall here. Right next to Mia. <laughs> just tell me what's going on. I'm telling you everything that I know. <laughs> we have to go this way. Uh-huh. Uh <laughs> Her mouth just stopped moving. <laughs> this game is tired of my shenanigans. And I have seen just straight up lazy.
And yes, since we're talking about this game in relation to the genre itself, we do have to mention that yes, there is a merch store in the menu of the first game, just like every other fucking person that talks about this goddamn fucking game. It has a merch store. Just like almost every other game in this genre that came before it, and just like almost every damn content creator on this website. Like, we sell merch at store.distractiblepodcast.com. We do! LTTstore.com. We brought you this video with our brand new limited edition Cyber Skeleton foil t shirt that we just posted on store.gamersaccess.net. We will talk about all of this more very shortly, but I will say this now. If you don't like the idea of a merch shop, ignore it. No one is forcing you to buy their stuff. Like, this is where I'm coming from. I don't like the Poppy Playtime developers. And that ain't because they dared to have a merch shop on the menu of their game. Literally one of the most inconsequential things about that game and the team. Speaking of which, the developers. The Euphoric Brothers and the criticisms they received, which means looking at a few reviews for the game. Normally I would save such a thing for the end of the critique, but since I'm talking about the rest of this stuff, this felt like the best place to do it. Since the video that I showed earlier, I dug a tiny bit myself. I made a community post to open up some discussion to try and get an understanding on everything, and I dug a little bit more after that. I know a great deal more now. Let's talk about the criticisms, and then we will talk about the developers. So, as I think pretty much everyone aware of these games knows already, when the first game dropped, the internet broke, and not in a good way. First, Let's Players found the game and played it, then uh yeah made his video on it, and then everything spiraled downward. They started receiving harsh criticism ranging from insults to accusations, being called lazy, passionless, babies, butthurt, uninspired, and only in this for the money. On a good day, I might be able to see why people had a problem with it, but I really honestly don't. You can say it's a lazy attempt at a cash grab, the first game was free. And there was no point where you were forced to buy anything from their merch store. It's just there. Hell, I forgot that it existed when I played. But the second game costs money. Yeah, and it's longer. So I think five dollars isn't too much to ask for. After all, these people basically gave them free advertising and made money off of playing their free game. After El Yaz's video, a couple other videos started coming in. Reviews of Garden of Bam Bam, videos about the developers, and I noticed one thing about some of them. I'm gonna hold off saying what it was, cause I wanna see if you'll see the same thing. Now there's two videos here, and don't worry I'm not gonna spend the entirety of this video responding to them, but I will look at some of the things they say. We have Demuted and Random Stuff Gaming here, and we'll start with Demuted because there were a few things that I agree with, but there are two things that he says that I want to directly address. It might be a bit disingenuous to compare a game made by a whole studio to a game made by two people. So how about some games made with similarly sized teams? Cave Story, Undertale, Axiom Verge, the original version of Stardew Valley, the original version of Minecraft, Iconoclasts. All of these are games developed either solely by one person, or by one person who sometimes had art or other assets made by people not directly working on the game. Or how about Hollow Knight, made by Team Cherry, a team of three people. That might be my favorite video game of all time, and it was made by a team that was only one adult human bigger than Ban Ban's development team. Alright, let me stop you right there, cause you'll notice a little something something. The majority of the games you listed are 2D games, which are not artistically comparable to 3D games. Implementing models and art in something like Stardew Valley is not the same for an Unreal project like Garden of Ban Ban. Especially if you're new to the engine, like I suspect is the case. And I don't think I need to remind anyone how buggy the old Minecraft actually was. And need I remind you of the first seven FNAF games? Need I remind you that Scott's amount of game development experience dwarfs the Euphoric Brothers by a landslide. 
And that's before talking about the Click Team engine. He might not be the absolute god of game development, but I don't think anyone can deny that Scott was really fucking good with what he was working with. Which comes down to experience. On top of that, the Euphoric brothers are not Scott Cawthon. So comparing them against each other in this context would be a little asinine. Now, Demuted here makes some points that the random guy also makes, so I'll save talking about those for when we look at his video. But there's a few other things that Demuted says that I want to talk about. You'll probably see why. And then we come to that little teaser in the corner. Now, as far as I know, this wasn't included at launch, but it didn't take long for it to show up. Garten of Ban Van 2, which is not really a sequel, but a continuation of an incomplete story what we normal people would call a chapter. Because if you think there's going to be any major differences between chapters 1 and 2, you're mistaken and maybe delusional. But the only thing I'm wondering is why isn't it out yet? It could just be that the chapter is longer, but I don't know if these devs would actually do that. So I'm showing this because this video was uploaded on February 7th. Garden 2 was released March 3rd. And I'll be jumping the gun a little bit here, but this dude is saying he doesn't know why Chapter 2 isn't out yet. But then this other fucking guy is saying that them releasing 2 a few months later means it's not worth the money. At launch of the first game, and then the second game coming out in two months. I'm sorry, if a game comes out in two months and it's made by two people, it's not worth $5. However- well, I guess that means that Five Nights at Freddy's 2 isn't worth the $8 that it's charging. Because, you know, it was made by one person, and it released three months after the first game. Yeah, but we're not going to talk about that. One says they're going too fast, the other says not fast enough. Like, guys, fucking pick one, honestly. And not giving the devs any benefit of the doubt that the second game will be longer, I think, is a little dickish. And you were also wrong, because the game was longer and had more going on. It had a plot line, though in fairness, it's really fucking hard to follow, but that's not what I really want to focus on. So what's the verdict on Garten of Ban Ban? Does it deserve the hate? Is it overblown? And what about the developers? Well, if you ask me, the hate is totally justified. There will be extremely rare moments in the entirety of my time on this platform where I will say that hate on a video game is justified. This is not one of those moments. I don't hate games. Even games that completely piss me off like Outlast 2, or One Late Night Deadline, or LEGO Star Wars 2 for the DS. I don't hate the games. You know what I do? I critique them. And I try to keep that critique as objective and constructive as possible. Why? Because that's an opportunity for up and coming game developers to learn from a bad example. To learn what not to do. To learn what to avoid. Alright, I'm done with him. Let's look at what Random has to say, but just in the interest of proving a point. I'm going to do a little something, but I want to know if you can spot what that is. Let me know if you do. Gurt a Ban Ban is an indie horror game that absolutely just throws in the towel and does not try at all. The game has been under fire because of the fact that from release, you could tell that the first priority was profit and the player's priority was way, way behind that. And you know, normally that's not too terrible. I mean, you know, it's looked down upon normally, but not as bad as, you know, people are making out to seem. But it's different because you know that the target audience for this game is very young. No! Obviously, the target audience is very young. I mean, when you have character designs that look like this, it's very clear that you're going to be attracting a certain type of people, especially a certain age of people. That it was made simply to appeal to kids. Seeing people praise these games, which are so clearly cash grabs, meant to get as much money out of their younger audience as possible. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? You know, maybe I'm just weird for not freaking out that a game dared to have a merch store, because I never buy anything more than just the game anyway. The only time I ever bought extra game-related things were the Amiibos for the Wii U and Switch games. Why? Because they have functionality. They had a purpose. They did things in the games. 
So the criticism is game bad because all about profit, and that's bad because marketed for kids. I feel like it's important to point out that the target demographic and it being profit focused have nothing to do with each other. Also, I feel like a dick for doing it, but I guess I have to fucking ask this. Do we now suddenly fucking believe that kids are the ones buying this shit? Let me take a moment to fucking remind people that these games can be marketed to kids all they want, but it's the parents that are paying, and said parents have every opportunity to say, no, I'm not buying that. Also, wait a minute, you're saying that kids were the target audience, but I thought this game was made to take over the YouTube algorithm. So wouldn't that make YouTubers the target audience? There is pretty much no trying to hide it here. This game was a calculated move to try to take over the YouTube algorithm. That's the other part of this. Even if the Euphoric Brothers, the developers of Banban, Ban, aren't making much financially from Banban Ban right now, I highly doubt that was their main incentive right now anyway. The game being free means more people can play it, and the higher chance it has to take over YouTube and get exposure and popularity that way. Once those seeds are planted, they can easily capitalize monetarily in the future. This game was made for attention, and it was made for that sole purpose alone. Now at least with the random guy's video, I can't say it's a dumb argument because the game was free, because he uploaded his video after Garten 2 was released. And how much did that cost? An earth shattering 5 US dollars. Do we seriously honestly think that's worth losing our shit over? I don't think $5 is too much to ask for more game time, voice acting, animation, and everything else that was present in the game. If it was something like $15, then yeah, I'd think that's a little much. But $5 for an indie title developed by two guys is not a big deal. Bowie, you're making the $5 argument. Don't worry, I thought about that too. My thing about that is it's not a recurring payment, it's not a subscription, and you're not just giving money to some loudmouth that's literally doing nothing. So for something like this, I don't see a problem with the price. Sure, it's not as polished as Poppy Playtime, but that's the difference that you're going to see between two guides and an entire fucking studio with artists. The game's very obviously very lazily made. I mean, you can't look at the characters and tell me that there was a lot of passion and thought put into these things. It's so obvious that it's just cash grab after cash grab and taking advantage of the genre as a whole. And furthermore, how lazy everything was. Show why I think these games are nothing more than a way for the developers to make a quick bug without actually putting effort into their games. You cannot tell me passion was put into any of this. Is anyone else getting deja vu here? Anyway, it is very easy to say this from an outside perspective after coming off of the Poppy Playtime hype train. Or, we could be less of a dick and chalk it up to not being familiar with the Unreal Engine yet and still wanting to get things out there. Also, I said Unity a couple times before, that's a misspeak on my part, it's not Unity, it's Unreal. Anyway, like I said before, the Euphoric Brothers made games before, yes, but they were 2D side-scroller games. That is different from an Unreal project. And if anyone saw any of the fucking learning Blender memes, 3D modeling is not fucking easy. So, guess what probably happened? They got the monsters to be a somewhat recognizable shape, said fuck it good enough, and drew the wall art after. Now, can that be a factor of laziness? Sure. Or, we could be less of an asshole and give the benefit of the doubt. Like, I don't want to be that guy that fucking quotes philosophy all the time, but fuck me, it still applies here. Occam's Razor. The explanation that requires the fewest assumptions is usually correct. At launch, the biggest thing, right, even though the game is free, on the main menu there was a merch button that you could buy merch for a game that just released and had absolutely zero traction before it. Now, insane. Upon booting up Garten of Banban, Ban, you get the absolute worst thing you can see on any immediate boot up page a merch store. 6th of 2023. And while this first entry in the series was free, it came right out of the box with a merch button. Nice. Garten of Banban Ban has a merch shop on the title screen. And yes, since we're talking about this game in relation to the genre itself, we do have to mention that yes, there is a merch store in the menu of the first game, just like every other fucking person that talks about this goddamn fucking game. Pay attention, you're saying the same shit that he said. You know what's crazy is that the merch store is optional, 
and no one is forcing you to buy anything from it. Like, okay, they made a merch store. Just like every other fucking mascot horror game after FNAF did. I don't care. They want money. Name a fucking developer that doesn't. Also, the merch store literally doesn't affect you in any capacity. They're not holding a gun to your head forcing you to buy their merch. You can ignore it. I promise, it's okay. And furthermore, a kid isn't buying the merch. They're going to the parent to ask if they can get it, and from that point on, it's the parent's fucking decision. And they have the ability to say no. Ah, but Bowie, what if the parent goes to that store because they want to get something for their kid, and they know their kid likes the games with the colorful monsters? Well, if the kid likes it, who gives a fuck? Like I said previously, if you don't like the idea of the merch store, ignore it. I don't like the Poppy Playtime developers, but it isn't because they have a fucking merch store. Guys, this obsession with potential profit and pointing and saying, THEY WANT MONEY! Like, that's... that's not healthy. Merch is a byproduct of content creation, and it's an easily fucking predictable one too. Like, if the idea of a merch store surprises you, at this point, I'm envious. Because they're everywhere. But we have got to stop crying wolf about this shit. This is not an automatic money printing factory like these guys like to imply by saying this shit. This is a money printing factory. This is predatory monetization. This is taking advantage of bad spending habits. Oh, what's a few more V-Bucks? That's pretty cheap. Oh, what's a few more tokens? That's pretty cheap. Oh, the new latest thing dropped. I need to get that. Oh, I need to get this new skin. It's only a couple dollars. What's the harm? Every. Single. Time. You want to talk about fucking draconian practices with money around gaming? I'd be very happy to have that fucking conversation. We can start with Xbox Live, or Game Pass, or PlayStation Plus, or Nintendo Online. Hit the fucking subscription services that trick you into thinking you own anything first. Then we'll circle around to where the companies really nail you. I would be happy to have that conversation. Because I was around to see the peak of the console wars. Xbox versus PlayStation, PC versus console. I saw all of that bullshit. I was around for the rampancy of loot boxes and microtransactions. I was around to see Battlefront 2's launch, the shit one, not the old one. And what's important is that I remember it. But Bowie, Game Pass is just a dollar. No the fuck it isn't. You gotta read what it says. You join for one dollar, then after 14 days, not even a fucking month, the subscription jumps up to the normal price of ten dollars. If you get the ultimate option, it's 17. But Bowie, you can play Xbox exclusive games. Sure, until you quit paying them. And can you believe that that's actually a downgrade from the system that they had before, which is what makes this such a slap in the fucking face to me? If anyone remembers the golden age of the Xbox 360 Xbox Live Gold, you would have one or two games ranging from indie titles to full-on AAA games, just free for that month or that week or something like that. And if you claim those free games, you can still play them, even after you quit paying for Xbox Live Gold. If you quit paying Game Pass, say goodbye to your ability to play those games. Paying a fucking subscription service to play games online for absolutely zero fucking reason. That fucking bullshit is a cash grab. I don't care that Poppy has a merch store. I don't care that Bendy has a merch store. I don't care that FNAF has merch. I don't care that Garten has merch. It's the most harmless way for a dev to make money outside of the game itself. And you know something that I noticed? You, random sir, for talking about the merch store and all that, couldn't help but notice you didn't mention it once in your own video playing the game. Almost like it's easy to ignore. You only mentioned it in your second video after everyone else talked about it. Obviously, regardless of whether the game was free or not, the game would have received an extra spike in criticism with the release of Garden of Man Man 2, but the game was $5 USD. That's more than FNAF 1.
Just some general advice, you know? For anyone kind of looking into getting to this area of YouTube, the review, critique of media, games, things like that, good rule of thumb, good thing to practice would be um, fact-checking yourself pretty often when uh, making definitive statements such as you know, the price of a game compared to the price of another game. Make sure that information that you are saying is correct so you don't end up spouting straight up lies and spreading misinformation. Misinformation to 17.1 thousand people. Oh, I'm sorry. 17.1 thousand people at minimum. You know, there's a saying that I keep in the back of my mind, and it works just beautifully here. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's more than Poppy Playtime Chapter 1, which is free, by the way. You know what's crazy is that you're right. Poppy Playtime Chapter 1 is free. Just like Garten of Bam Bam 1, oddly enough. You know what isn't free? Poppy Chapter 2, which costs twice as much as Garten Chapter 2. Not saying anything in particular, I just prefer to have all of that information out there. Also, did you know that Poppy Chapter 3 is $15? No, you're right, I am saying something. Look, if we're comparing these two games, let's compare them chapter to chapter. That makes the most logical sense to me. Chapter 1 to Chapter 1, Chapter 2 to Chapter 2, Chapter 3 to Chapter 3. Compare the free game to the free game, and the paid game to the paid game. Not mixing and matching just to make your argument look better. Which means I need to spend $25 on pop- God fucking damn it. Now because of this, the game received a lot, and I mean a lot, of criticism from people all around the world, creators and just Twitter users alike. And they responded uh, in very interesting ways. Not ways that, you know, me personally would recommend, but you know, I'm not a PR person or anything like that, so I don't know. Mainly they would uh, go on Twitter and post screenshots of people sending them, you know, things that are really not nice. I don't condone things like death threats or threats of any kind, obviously, so please, do not do that by watching this after watching this video. Please don't. I think that should be obvious, but it's only fair to address that, number one. And number two, it's very clear that these people do not like to listen to criticism unless it's delivered to them in a very particular way. And the Euphoric Brothers, well, they didn't respond well to criticism. But before I do, I feel it's only my responsibility as a YouTuber to say that you shouldn't go out and harass these guys. You can hate the game, you might even find the devs to be annoying, but it's never okay to send threats of violence or harassing messages. God damn, it's like a fucking echo in here. People don't tend to listen to people yelling at them, so if you can take anything from this video, just go forward and just try to actually make an impact with with this. So it started with that, then they, they tweeted some other, like, bad rebuttals that made no sense, I don't know. But most recently they tweeted this, and it says, There is a difference between criticizing slash making fun of a game and outright scummy behavior. Regardless of what you think of a game, how pitiful is it to fully play it, then refund it, especially if you are streaming it and making many times the original price during the stream. But the, the real go-getter here is that linked on this tweet are four screenshots of tweets and Steam reviews basically calling people out. We have one of, uh, yeah, a YouTuber that you've probably watched at least once, David Barron, a good friend of mine, me, which was strange, and then a random Steam reviewer that I don't know if they make content, but regardless, if anything, if they don't make content and they're just some random viewer, that almost makes it worse. And I understand that all of these were public. You know, you could go out and find these on your own. You know, I tweeted that, and that's me. You know, it's public, anybody can go see it. Same thing with that Steam review. But as a developer, you hold a responsibility when it comes to these things. You can't just willy-nilly tweet out people's names because of the fact that your following is largely in your favor. So they are going to defend you to the end. When you spout out these things, just showing names of people that, you know, are public enemy number one, basically, at this point, it's not a good look on from an outside perspective. And in this video, I think this is a good opportunity for me to explain myself because of the fact that they directly pointed me out as one of these people, so I think it's only fair. Number one. Garden of Ban Ban 2 is not worth $5. 
I'm sorry, it is not. If I were a YouTuber or was not a YouTuber, if I had any social media presence or not, I would have refunded this game after buying it. That is the bottom line. It's just the fact that I went on Twitter and tweeted about it, joking about it. That's what makes the difference, apparently. And I disagree, I think $5 is fine. The difference is not you joking about it on Twitter. The difference is you responding to a dude who wasn't offering feedback, and instead just said, fuck this game to his larger following, if we want to talk about social media responsibility, and move the fuck on. Very much a case of guilty by association. At least from the outside looking in. As far as the criticisms and the response from the devs is concerned, I can see both sides. Players saw the first game and saw a very short experience, with not much to offer and not much detail put into anything. So harsh criticisms ensued, and they were calling out the devs for being a cash grab, lazy and uninspired, when they saw the second game cost $5 with not much improvement to the art style or graphics or horror elements or mechanics. But I can also see their side. They weren't done yet. Far from it. They had a story and a goal in mind and they wanted this to be a little teaser to try to hook people in with a sort of small mystery. Where did the kids go? What are these creatures? And why is there a bottomless void in the ball pit room? And all of this while learning how to create on the Unreal Engine since their only experience outside of Egghead Gumpty was 2D side scrollers. And if you aren't good at 3D modeling, which is not absurd, all you have to work with is pre-made assets. Yet all of this stuff was coming in about how lazy they were, but they haven't even gotten started yet. I can understand being a little upset about that, not justifying how they handled responses, but I can understand it. There have been examples of poor reception of criticism before. One of the more memorable for me was JC the Hyena after his Sonic.exe story was removed from Creepypasta. It isn't easy for an artist in any form to be told that their work just isn't good enough. And unfortunately, a lot of them don't know how to respond well to that. But a lot of that also has to do with the feedback that they receive. If all they get is feedback that isn't constructive and overly harsh, then yeah, they probably won't respond well. Now I agree that consumers are within their right to refund a product if they believe it does not meet their expectations of quality, and it is the responsibility of the content creator to take that feedback and improve. This kind of thing can be applied to anything, not just games. Well, let's talk about the second game and the whole refunding situation. Scrolling through the Steam reviews, which I do not recommend, there were a lot of people that refunded the game. As the game is only sold on Steam, naturally the developers would probably be paying a lot of attention to what the reviews on Steam would say since they're actually selling this game for money. Now because it's Steam, unfortunately the large majority of them are about as helpful as you would expect. You have to play the game for 8 hours to unlock- WHY?! Jumbo Josh appears in the corridor, his presence dark, hot, and glooming. i never seen anyone like him before, even as I peered into the corner and stared into those pitch black eyes. His presence was mesmerizing. I thought I'd seen everything, but I'm just gonna stop reading. What the fuck am I reading? <laughs> this is the- <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Now there are some that can actually be considered more along the lines of constructive criticism, albeit the wording could use some work. But I can forgive them for not seeing these in the sea of everything else. And they responded uh, in very interesting ways. Not ways that, you know, me personally would recommend, but you know, I'm not a PR person or anything like that, so I don't know. So it started with that, then they, they tweeted some other like bad rebuttals that made no sense, I don't know. But most recently they tweeted this, and it says, there is a difference between criticizing slash making fun of a game and outright scummy behavior. Regardless of what you think of a game, how pitiful is it to fully play it, then refund it, especially if you are streaming it and making many times the original price during the stream. But the, the real go-getter here is that linked on this tweet are four screenshots of tweets and Steam reviews 
basically calling people out. We have one of, uh, yeah, a YouTuber that you've probably watched at least once, David Barron, a good friend of mine, me, which was strange, and then a random Steam reviewer that I don't know if they make content, but regardless, if anything, if they don't make content and they're just some random viewer, that almost makes it worse. And I understand that all of these were public. You know, you could go out and find these on your own. You know, I tweeted that and that's me. You know, it's public. Anybody can go see it. Same thing with that Steam review. But as a developer, you hold a responsibility when it comes to these things. You can't just willy-nilly tweet out people's names because of the fact that your following is largely in your favor. So they are going to defend you to the end. When you spat out these things, just showing names of people that, you know, are public enemy number one, basically at this point, it's not a good look on from an outside perspective. So when uh yeah made his video trashing on the game and then went on his little Twitter rampage by nonstop memeing on them and saying the game gaslit people, and then posted his fuck this game tweet to his pretty sizable following. Was that a good look? Is it okay for him to do all that, but it's not okay for the devs to respond? Hmm. Alright, fucking Twitter, here we go with this. I agree with the criticism that, yes, as a developer of a game, you do have to be careful with how you conduct yourself on a public platform. That said, the argument of showing names not looking good, I disagree. I think if you're going to call someone out, and if said someone acted like a dick, and it's all public anyway, have some fucking balls and call them out by name. Your responsibility is making sure you do everything on your part to make sure your fan base doesn't harass. This is typically done by saying, hey, don't harass this person, but yeah, fuck this guy, look what he said. On January 16th, they posted the iconic tweet when a new indie horror game with a main menu gets released, showing a picture of Jumbo Josh and Opila Bird about to be hung beside Huggy Wuggy and Blue. Needless to say, the point wasn't just missed, it veered off course into an orphanage. I don't think it was, because what was one of the things that people were yelling about? At launch, the biggest thing. Right? Even though the game is free, on the main menu there was a merch button that you could buy merch for a game that just released and had absolutely zero traction before it. Now, insane. Upon booting up Garten of Ban Ban, you get the absolute worst thing you can see on any immediate boot up page. A merch store. 6th of 2023, and while this first entry in the series was free, it came right out of the box with a merch button. Nice. Garten of Ban Ban has a merch shop on the title screen. Something that Poppy Playtime, Rainbow Friends, and Bendy have. And dude, don't act like this is your first time seeing this fucking meme. I'm actually kind of impressed with them. Pretty stylized, having Poppy, Rainbow Friends, and Garten drawn in the Bendy art style. Also, it's gone in the second game. So I don't think they missed the point. And all of this stuff came after the uh yeah thing. So all of this bullshit trash talking about the games and the devs are just echoes of shit that he said. And yeah, they blocked him on Twitter. Them for. But I do want to dig at them for blocking Oh uh, Yeah on Twitter. I mean, I said it earlier, but without this Canadian furry, Ban Ban would be nowhere near the size it is now. And instead of making a veritable ally out of the guy who memed their game so hard it blew up, they instead want to keep him as far away from the game as possible. A more Shakespearean tragedy I have never seen. And probably a very dumb move, as it broke arguably their biggest shield from criticism. That being that they're self-aware. That Ban Ban could at the very least be chalked up to parody. Alright, I don't like being harsh, but are you like, brain dead? A shield from criticism. He made a 14 minute video saying the game was lazy and uninspired and that the game was gaslighting people and blamed them and their game for shit that he did and offering no constructive criticism whatsoever saying that the game didn't deserve it. He was a raging dick. I don't blame them. I don't like the guy either. Like, all of these people calling them babies, talentless, lazy, money hungry, just completely shitting on them, just... Actually, fuck off. Like, I agree with them. There is a difference between criticizing and making fun of a game and outright shitty behavior. Shouldn't have said the pitiful stuff. That's an example of not taking it well. And yeah, making a tweet with a screenshot saying fuck this game or saying the game is gaslighting people 
or saying it's lazy and uninspired and absolutely nothing fucking else, or that there's no passion, is shitty fucking behavior. As we've seen before, I get why they blocked him. Leave him blocked. Fuck him. Like I said at the start, the fucking way that all of this shit, at least on the YouTube side, was handled, just sends me over the fucking edge. And maybe I should explain why, because I assume right now I just seem like a guy that's mad about nothing. In any art form, be that contemporary art, drawing, story writing, book binding, leather working, filmmaking, game development, even building a fucking computer sometimes, the absolute single most important part of that craft is constructive criticism so that the person can fucking grow and improve. And so far, all I have fucking heard from people on this fucking website is just continuous bashing. They're lazy. They're a cash grab. They're milking. They're crying. They're babies. What fucking part of that helps anyone improve? What fucking part of that is constructive? Well, if you ask me, the hate is totally justified. In what universe is it justified to dogpile and hate on a game because you think the devs are being lazy when the game is fucking free? Like I said before, I don't hate games. There is absolutely nothing constructive that comes out of hating a game. I critique it, and I try to keep it as objective and constructive as possible. And that is what I'm going to do for this franchise. I will practice what I've preached before, and play the games myself, think about them, and come to my own fucking conclusions about the series. And before I continue, I'll add a little note here. I am aware of this video by Astral Spiff. I'm not entertaining the arguments he makes in his video. He compares people refunding the game to creators not getting ad revenue because of ad blockers and argues that people can watch streams for free even though he knows full well that streamers around his size and up get donations and shit no matter what. And also argues that streamers aren't making money off of the Euphoric Brothers games, they're making money off of making content that people enjoy so the devs can suck it. The video made me lose all respect for the man. And this is all argumentation that I heard before. You wanna guess what from? Well, it's when React culture was being called out for streamers essentially stealing content by just watching it on stream and not transforming it. If you're interested in learning about that, there's a wonderful video by JXE that talks about all of it. And the link will be down below. So if anyone has any solid and specific information slash example of someone giving them constructive feedback outside of the one person that I have seen that I will mention in a little bit that I can see for myself and verify and point to and say, see, there it is. Say it in the comments. Try to get with me. We'll get that figured out. Because outside of the one, I haven't seen it on YouTube. So either I'm in the wrong part of YouTube, which is entirely likely, or it's all on Twitter which I avoid being on as much as humanly possible. I have an account. I just choose not to be on it. But me not wanting to go on Twitter is no excuse when there are answers that need to be found. So I went on fucking Twitter. And right away, I'm reminded why I don't bother with this fucking website. Because you have the fake account, which looks like the real account, and then you have the real account. First thing I looked for was any information about the Brazilian part of Discord, because evidently a few things were going on with it. I got some people saying it got banned because they criticized the games, that being countered with someone saying it just got muted due to a raid. The only thing I could find from them about Brazil is this post from them saying two guys got removed because they broke embargo, but everything is cool now. Also, I couldn't get into their Discord, and I don't know why. I know why, I'm just dumb. I'm on their Discord now. 
I found this chain saying they were leaving Twitter for a time due to death threats, which, uh, I mean, I'm on two sides of that. On one, it's like, I remember my first day on the internet, but on the other side, this game did kind of explode, and this particular part of the thread, yeah, I get it. Certain big figures in the toxic part of the indie community whose fans blindly follow them. I can only guess at which people they're talking about. And I'll probably be right. People, not individual. Anyway, I went down a fucking rabbit hole as one usually does on Twitter and I didn't find anything related to constructive criticism on there. So I'll say again, if anyone has anything specific, tell me about it in the comments. Email me. Just get in contact with me. And I'm not going back on Twitter. Everything that I have seen has been this insane knee-jerk reaction and biting their heads off. Like, I played the first game, and I saw the little two thing in the corner, and my friend and I picked up on it immediately. This wasn't a full experience, and the next chapter will come later. They don't have a lot of experience with Unreal, so it wasn't as polished as, say, Poppy Playtime. But rather than seeing anything, providing them with feedback to help them improve, advice they can work from, all they got was memes, people telling them they're only in it for the money, they're lazy, etc, etc, and... him. A fucking mockery of constructive criticism. I have never in my entire life, ever seen such a bombardment of hate, just echoing things that one jackass on the internet said. The majority of the response that I have seen about this just has such a Twitter mob mentality, not an ounce of thinking for themselves, and just a void of toxic behavior that I just can't get behind. It's exhausting. Anyway, we're coming to the end of the points that I wanted to look at, so we'll just take a quick look at the last few things here. That I am going to acknowledge the fact that, you know, this video isn't very structured just because of the fact that I'm kind of upset by this. This is making me really genuinely mad. And you know what? Euphoric Brothers, maybe you shouldn't have made that tweet because I don't think this video would happen in the first place. You did this to yourself, buddy. So... You made this whole ass video because they put you in a tweet. Dude, fuck off and grow some thicker skin. And wipe that fake ass smirk off your face. You hold a responsibility when it comes to these things. You can't just willy nilly tweet out people's names because of the fact that your following is largely in your favor. So they are going to defend you to the end. When you spout out these things, just showing names of people that, you know, are public enemy number one, basically, at this point, it's not a good look on from an outside perspective. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. This problem actually became so prevalent with people sharing it on Twitter that the developers of the game commented on the fact that people were refunding, calling it scummy behavior. In my opinion, I can see both sides. Yeah, it isn't really a good look to refund the game, especially for YouTubers and streamers who were profiting off of it, but at the same time, if the game is so short that it could be refunded after completing it, then it shouldn't really be sold on Steam for such a high price in the first place. Well, I guess you should just go ahead and refund the OG FNAF then, right? Because, you know, you can beat it in about an hour, start to finish, if you're good enough, and hey, if it's so short that it can be refunded after beating it, shouldn't be sold for such high price, right? Ah, oh, but you ain't gonna do that, are you? It's almost like it's a nonsensical fucking argument. So... If you haven't been able to tell what I've been doing with this little section, it's almost impressive how many times these people all say the same things almost word for word. It's like they're reading from the same damn script. Now, all of that bullshit said, I do acknowledge that there were very few moments of fair critique and observations made about the game that I would like to bring attention to, because positives are important as well. Horror games with, like, minimal instructions are very novel to me, and if they're done right, I think they can be really cool, but at the same time, when you get stuff like this, it just Wait. confuses the shit out of you. 
which I agree with. How to tell the player what to do is one of those things that will be an ongoing debate, same with deciding if your character should speak or not. Most common method is some sort of objectives tab, while some of the more hardcore games just throw you in the world and say good luck. But as the guy said, for things like this, not having clearly defined objectives that also make sense narratively, that's important, makes the game really confusing. And here I will take a moment to talk about that one video that I mentioned. I do know that not every single video about Garten of Ban Ban is like the bullshit that you just saw right now, and I will draw your attention to a channel called F Min 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 Minaxa Minaxa. This channel, who, in my personal opinion, did a fantastic job talking about Garten 2. I think his approach and everything that he said was incredibly fair. He hits all the points that I would have brought up, and they were like one or two things that I very minorly disagreed with. And what's fucking crazy is that it took me all of 12 seconds listening to how he spoke in the beginning of the video to know what the quality of the video would be. I have been told that the developers have received good, constructive feedback in the past and just ignored it. It is very possible that I am either just blind or I haven't found it through the sea of content just shitting on them. And outside of this person's video, I have not found a single thing giving the game's constructive criticism yet. Everything has either been rant videos about the game, the devs like Demuted and Random, or videos like Reponed here just laughing at it. And I'm sorry, but I think making a 9 minute video and saying you're talking about all of the games is so low effort it makes Jinx reaction videos seem like hard work. That might be going a bit far, but 9 minutes? For all of the games? Really? If it does exist, and there are more people out there that gave them constructive criticism, like I said, share that with me. Tell me a Twitter name or a post. Tell me a YouTube video or a channel. Something that I can look up and verify for myself. And I will make an amendment to this part of the video in the form of a pinned comment. Until that happens, I will continue with the thought process that I have right now. Are there issues in the games? Yes. Does that warrant unbridled rage and outright hate? No. Never has never fucking will. Now let's talk about their response. Unfortunately, the only place I have to go to look at where they kind of responded to stuff is on Twitter. Again. And combined with the fact that I don't know how this place works, I'm kind of limited on what I'm finding, but I figured their Twitter page was good enough. So, we saw pretty much all of these tweets already, let's actually read them and talk about them. The first one that I saw that was a response, kinda, was the first time post. Now I can understand if you never saw the meme that's being referenced here, that it can be kinda odd to see. But fortunately, I remembered that the meme image existed and proceeded to not care about the imagery outside of what I said before. Poppy, Rainbow Friends, Ben the Art Style, I think it's neat. Let's talk about what it says. When an indie horror game with a main menu gets released, the context of what they mean shown in the picture. Known games with merch stores in the menu on the block asking Garten if this is their first time receiving the critique that is, they have a merch store. Now I do have to side for a brief moment with some of the people we looked at because Guys, it, it wasn't about the menu, it was about the thing on the menu. But I mean, this looks like it was supposed to be taken as a joke to me, so I don't see it as too particularly egregious. So let's talk about the next one that I come up to. The Death Threats one. This is what happens when you make an indie horror game in 2023. Death Threats, Extreme Harassment, and non-stop abuse all for a free game. Now, like I said, I'm torn about this kind of thing because on one hand, I remember my first time on the internet. A lot of people that are in the spotlight get death threats. I'm sure even Oh Yeah gets some. 
It is, unfortunately, a common part of being known on the internet. Because there's anonymity out here. So people feel more comfortable with saying whatever they want and consequences be damned. You have to learn to identify which comments and messages to take seriously and which ones to just ignore. But at the same time, if you're not used to it and it is your first time, I get it. I'm not without sympathy, and I agree. I think that this kind of attention when the game is free is ridiculous. But it also needs to be said that a large amount of people see calling attention to it as an attempt to farm sympathy and easy pity points. Like I said, I don't know about this one. On one hand, I get it. On the other, there are people that do it for sympathy. I, I don't know. Let's look at this one, the one that I showed earlier. As lots know, we've been getting tons of hate since Garden of Ban Ban released. But what a lot don't know is what's been happening behind the scenes. The situation has escalated so much that it's now affecting our own and family's safety. We have endured a lot mentally, but when it comes to receiving physical threats that reach our personal life and family, that is the end of the line for us on Twitter. Obviously, not to mention all sorts of other harassment that has been going on since the game released. To address the elephant in the room, what caused all of this is our game becoming too popular and successful for certain big figures in the toxic part of the indie horror community. They have continuously weaponized their massive followings against us. You hold a responsibility when it comes to these things. You can't just willy-nilly tweet out people's names because of the fact that your following is largely in your favor. So they are going to defend you to the end. When you spout out these things, just showing names of people that, you know, are public enemy number one, basically, at this point, it's not a good look on, from an outside perspective. It is sad how some of their fans follow their lead blindly without, with complete disregard to the morality of their actions and how genuinely awful slash toxic those people are. We hope the community will wake up and change this soon. We've been surviving the endless attacks here, but as mentioned earlier, our safety is now in question. If any harm reaches us, we will be referencing everything that has been transpired, that has transpired, and the people involved when we talk to the authorities. It is worth mentioning that this is all against two brothers in school, working non-stop and completely alone on a 100% personal budget. If you backtrack, you'll find that we've harmed no one and did absolutely nothing wrong. All we did was release a free game. We are not closing the account to prevent impersonation. Nothing will change regarding the game. Development of Garden of Ban Ban will continue as normal. We are not giving up on our dream. I mean, there really isn't much for me to say about this one. If they say that things have been bleeding into real life outside of the internet, and people have been going after them like that, I mean, I've seen worse for less reasons, so it's plausible. So I think they made the right decision by leaving for a bit. Next, oh boy, this one. Talked about this already, there is a difference. And despite the pitiful part, because we want to avoid insulting people when we're in game development responding to things like this, I get their perspective, especially the streaming part of it. The game costs five US dollars, and the guys they put in this collage are pretty fairly sized. So if they stream, they get ad revenue, donations, and they easily surpass that five dollar mark. But they have this hate train going on and refund the game. Trust me, I get it. And since I'm the one on Twitter, we can actually see the comments and we'll see the rest in a second, but I want to talk about this one in the screenshot here. Agreed. If you're a content creator using a game for content, especially if that content is monetized, then refunding it is scummy regardless of quality. Broadcasting the fact and encouraging others to do so is even worse. Super horror bro, I don't know you. 
only heard of you, unfortunately, because of, oh yeah, but I like you already, sir. And might I say, bold of you to bring reason and understanding into the comments, because he is absolutely fucking right. When you're using a piece of media as a springboard for you to make content, specifically a game or something that you pay for, and you refund it after you're done, fuck you. Because now, you essentially freebooted and stolen that content. You gained monetarily off of someone else's work, and you won't even give them the courtesy of compensating them for that fact. Social media responsibility. 100% correct. Unfortunately, Twitter will be Twitter. Then make a better fucking game instead of crying about it on Twitter. Don't care, plus cry harder. I don't care. Gonna cry? Oh no, someone thought your game was bad? How will you ever recover? Maybe actually make an original game with love instead of fucking cash grab. Maybe a better game then. Even Poppy Playtime did a better job. Cope harder. How about putting actual effort in your game instead of making people pay for a Roblox game? More shit that just isn't constructive in the slightest. But I will say there were some pretty positive comments to counter this, so we'll look at those too. Take my advice and use the money you've earned to hire a really high quality team. Then check out some of the best fan artists and either hire them or take some serious inspiration from them. Don't take it to heart as a lot of those critics like that are spoiled brats. Everything is in life. I have a start. Jesus fucking Christ. This... <sighs> guys, please work on your fucking grammar, guys. Holy shit. Don't take it to heart as a lot of those critics like that are spoiled brats. Everything is in life. I have a start. And your game is already a success depending on the quality. Many can't even get to the halfway point, guy. <laughs> I am disappointed. Oh, yeah, I would say this. I even found some things in the game funny and scared me with some characters. Yes, it is a good game. Congratulations. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. 30 minute game. Garden 2 is like an hour. What the, what the fuck? Exactly. I bought your game and didn't refund it. Hope you keep the money. Honestly, if some random person doesn't enjoy it and return it, cool. But a personality that got content, streams, donations, and more out of it? I don't think $5 is that high of a price. If for some scam I am rich app deal, sure, return it. Now, this gives a little bit of credence to the idea that the brothers don't Listen to any form of criticism. I know, I know, you ain't reading all this. On one hand, the game is definitely not the best, nor is it very long. Parts of it feel padded out specifically to prevent people from refunding it. The game has problems, and probably isn't worth the current price. If you're just a normal guy and you didn't enjoy it, refund it, sure. On the other hand, the game is clearly entertaining to watch people play and talk about it. It's viral for a reason. And I think for an influencer to refund a game that was actually a very successful investment for the channel is rather immoral. They may not have enjoyed the experience, but they, without a doubt, gained a lot of money and attention from it. The game's quality no longer matters. Of course, an influencer can still leave a negative review or even make a video discourage people from discouraging people from playing it. Maybe even more making even more money in the process. But to refund it uh, It's not like these YouTubers weren't already aware the game had a bad reputation. They saw the negative comments, bought the game, made presumably thousands of dollars off of shitting on it and are now refunding it. Is that not just as scummy as releasing a shitty game on Steam hoping to make a profit hoping to make a profit from it? Maybe I'm more sensitive to this since I've seen YouTubers make thousands 
times more money than I have by playing my stuff. I don't think Garden of Ban Ban 1 slash 2 are good games, but influencers should probably have more class when these projects, no matter how bad they might be, are the fuel of their livelihoods. Incredibly fair. Incredibly fucking fair. Hits the mark on all fucking accounts. And what do they get in return? Blocked. Blocked. Why? Why would you block someone who gives a comment like that? So in that regard, I can see the argument that they ignore criticism. And guys, that is a shitty thing to do. The man gave you the best comment you could ever hope for. Block a yeah. Do not block people like him. And since we're kind of on that topic, let's talk about it. Garten 2 got mass refunding. So it is theorized that Garten 3 got stretched out to make sure people went over the two hour mark so they couldn't refund the game. Which, guys, if that is what happened, that is not the right way to handle that. I get it. I promise, I get it. It is a completely shitty thing for them to do. But that is not how you handle that problem. We'll talk about what you could have done when we talk about the games themselves. So after looking at all of this, I just had this nagging feeling in the back of my mind. So the first thing I did was try to find out how old they were. Ferris, the older brother, was 19 in 2021, which means when he made Garden of Bam Bam, released in 2023, he was... 21! And Geppo was younger. And only sort of depending on which one of them handles Twitter, their responses start making more and more sense to me the more I learn about everything. Look, younger people do stupid things and say stupid shit. I think I showed plenty of examples of that by now. Now, we've looked at all of the Twitter posts in question about this game series now, so I don't need to show them again. So here's my thing. I am of the firm belief that Twitter brings out the worst in people. I have seen it time and time again. People getting into fights and saying shit they normally wouldn't say. I've seen grown-ass men act like spoiled children over the dumbest shit. I've seen normally rational people just lose their minds when things don't go their way. I've seen fucking grooming. I've seen a sea of the worst stuff imaginable. I've seen it take a huge toll on people's mental health. And that's why I avoid it like it's a fucking plague, because in my mind it is. And let me tell you, 21 is an adult, but that's still really fucking young. Now that doesn't mean that I'm saying they're in the clear, because they're not. At the end of the day, you have to be open and receptive to criticism, even the harsh stuff. And I'm not talking about the hate messages and the death threats or oh yes, bullshit. But it's that thing that I say quite a bit. If multiple people are saying the same thing, maybe they're on to something. For me, it's the fact that they're even answering at all. That tells me that they at least care to some sort of degree. Because fucking trust me, if they didn't give a single fuck about anything that anyone said about their game, they wouldn't say jack shit, and the game would just rot left there to collect any potential future sales and move on as if we don't exist. Not that I have an example of a game that happened to on the screen right now. So, I don't know. I just don't know. But as much as my friend and I joked about it, and as fucking irritated I got at, oh uh, yeah, and just the situation in general, I don't like being negative and I don't want to automatically default to negative. 
The whole money thing these days, I don't fucking care. And maybe super detailed textures and volumetric lighting and super scary stuff and good animation and super cool gameplay wasn't their focus. At least, not at the start. Maybe they just have a story that they want to tell, and if that's the case, I can't fault anyone for that. And you know what? I hope they do just want to tell a story. They certainly have an idea, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't interested. I just don't like discouraging creators. As much as I don't like the man, I'll never say that Ah uh, Yeah should stop making videos. Just like I won't say that these guys should stop making games. You want to talk about lazy? I can show you a lazy game. You want to talk about a developer that doesn't give a fuck? I'm, I can point them out. I've seen a lot of games. A lot of games. Far worse than these. And more on that point, the reason why I'm so against lighting up these guys in particular is because I literally just fucking saw it happen, albeit a year after the fact, to another developer that coincidentally, oh uh, yeah, was also involved in. Now, the Euphoric Brothers games and Arjax Post Shift 2 cannot be compared to each other, but it doesn't matter. They are still developers of games. And I watched this talented man get torn down and shamed because of a collection of mistakes, and it was done publicly to 1.9 million people. You hold a responsibility when it comes to these things. You can't just willy-nilly tweet out people's names because of the fact that your following is largely in your favor. So they are going to defend you to the end. When you spout out these things, just showing names of people that, you know, are public enemy number one, basically, at this point, it's not a good look on, from an outside perspective. As a result of this, the most recent activity that I could find from him was a music video that he posted on his YouTube channel four months ago as of the recording of this line, and Post Shift 2 was the very last game he made with an update post made one year ago saying, I will keep you posted when more developments have been made. And after that, silence. I reached out to him on DeviantArt to see if he's willing to just talk to anyone privately and check on him. Because after a comment someone made recently, it was something that I really should have done when I made my video. And I wanted to reach out on Twitter, but I need to pay to do that, and no. Though the last activity on Twitter was from 2022. The man has completely checked out of game development. And this, sure as shit, didn't help to keep that from happening. If we want to talk about social media responsibility, no developer, and I mean absolutely no developer whatsoever, deserves that kind of treatment. Unless they committed a fucking crime and it was definitely proven that they were guilty. That's the only exception that I can think of. Like, it's not okay to do it to Arjak, but it is okay to do it to these guys. And it's okay because this doesn't look like this, and also this. This fucking mascot horror poppy whatever the fuck community disappoints me. To a degree that I really didn't think was possible, but here we are. And I'll quantify this with a simple question. How many of you actually fucking reached out and just asked them about this stuff? Cause I did. It's not like it's hard to do. They're not a triple-A multi-million dollar studio. None of you. Not you, not you, not you, not you, and not you. Though it's probably a good fucking thing that you didn't, given your track record of talking to developers. None of you even fucking bothered. Because it's easier to make claims rather than just reach out and talk. Basic fucking courtesy. But no, you want to hide behind Twitter and YouTube. Twitter is not the same as a fucking conversation. So in this very, very specific case, I think what happened, and there are some strong implications that this might be correct, but again, I can't be 100% sure yet, is that people started saying that they received criticism, 
And then everyone just started saying that. But no one ever really did it. And just so we're all on the same fucking page. This is not constructive criticism. These are not constructive criticism. This is not fucking constructive criticism. And this sure as shit is not constructive criticism. And since I know I'll be asked about it, I'll quickly address this. Yes, I am aware of the games and the particular game that was made in the past, and here's my stance on that. I am consciously ignoring it, and I'm not going to talk about it. I am not justifying the game's creation, nor do I feel like I am the right person to talk about it. However, the past is the past, and that's where it should stay. It seems pretty clear to me that they're moving on from all of that, so I think for now, we should do the same. Are there things to criticize one or both of the developers for? Yes. Does that give anyone any right to lie and misrepresent or insult and mock rather than try to help? No. And it needs to be noted that the Euphoric Brothers did unblock everyone that they blocked at the start of 2024 to start the year fresh, and that includes, oh uh, yeah. But as I've said in a few videos previously, I personally don't like talking about developers in my videos because I don't know what's going on on their end. So with that said, I've talked about the developers and the rest of this stuff as much as I feel comfortable with. So now I can focus on what I actually want to talk about, the games themselves. So in the next video, we will do exactly that. I appreciate you all taking the time to watch this, even though this isn't a critique of the games. I felt like it was important to talk about all this stuff surrounding the game, since the vocal majority had what I believe was a disproportionate amount of hate. Regardless, the next video will be a critique of the games. I hope you're all excited, because I know I am. I'll see you then.